have to come back to the fundamental truth that these things are happening because there was a rejection of the law of God and a rejection of the kingship of Jesus Christ. It all comes back to that. This is the choice we have. If we're not going to be ruled by Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, our Savior, if we're not going to be ruled by him as ultimately the lawgiver and ultimately, finally, the judge and ultimately the one who punishes and rewards, I mean, the lawgiver who, who lays down the law and has the right to command us uh, about what is right and what is wrong. And uh, then is the judge who has the power to judge, to determine our compliance or our non-compliance with that law. And then to, to punish those who, who uh, defy the law, his law, or to reward those who comply with his law. Um, if, we, if we reject that, that his, his overriding authority and dominion over all the human race, this is what exactly, exactly what we're going to wind up with. This is almost inevitable that this is going to happen, where the law of Christ and his kingly power are rejected. You, you basically reject Jesus Christ as king, as Lord, and you have just placed yourself in the power, basically, of hell. And uh, the worst of human nature, the most corrupt human nature. Then it's a matter only of how bad things will be and how bad things can get. And ultimately, it's going to get from bad to worse because the more corrupt person is going to be the one who has the greater power, will seize the more power by virtue of being, being more corrupt and uh, not being restrained in any way. Ultimately, um, you know, we know where history goes. It goes to a worldwide dominion of an antichrist. We have every reason to believe that says that's where we're heading right now. Um, but it, it, it all starts with the rejection of the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ and his dominion over mankind. That's what our message has to be, really, in this world today, I think. Our message has to be, the message each and every one of us has to be that Jesus Christ is and ought to be the king. He is the king of all mankind. He is the Lord of all mankind. He is the lawgiver and the judge and the rewarder or punisher of all mankind. And that's simply a matter of fact. We actually believe that absolutely. And that has to be the message that we get out there. That's the first step. One says, well, what can we do about this? Well, the first step is to proclaim loudly before the whole world, boldly and, and without any hesitation, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the King of all mankind. And if you reject his kingship, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get hell on earth of our own making. The only, the only way to be saved from that, Jesus Christ became... Uh, man, the Son of God became man and came to earth to save us from hell. If we will not have him, if we will not have him to rule over us, then we will create hell on earth for ourselves. And he cannot save us from hell here, even on earth, if we will not have him to rule over us. So it has to start there with people, those who still have the faith in our Lord and who love him to stand up and proclaim that he is the king. Now, after that, there is the question of how do we actually make that happen? Well, we realize that if, if our society has gone the way it has and is in the condition it's in now, it's due to a rejection of our Lord, then as we proclaim his rights as the Lord and King, hopefully we will appeal to all the good and decent souls out there who still have faith, or at least open to, to receiving the grace of faith. And they'll realize, I see what's happening. I see how horrible it is. And actually, that's the only explanation that makes any sense. That it's a choice between our Lord Jesus Christ and his rule over us, or this, a resident Biden, or a Xi Jinping, or, or a Zelensky, whoever. Right? This is the alternative. Who's going to have the rule? Who's going to control our lives? And... Um, Hopefully, people will listen to that. And as, as they do, and they realize what the problem really is, 
Now you can give them a moral backbone. Now suddenly they're vertebrates. Now they can actually stand on their own, on their own two feet by the grace of God, and they can um, almost be like the dry bones that have, that have been risen in Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter 7. Um, now they can stand up, and now they have a voice and they can be heard. Because now they have the moral gumption and the moral force behind them of faith and hope and hopefully charity, love for our Lord, to stand up for what is right. And in a society such as ours, that's what you need. You need a moral populace who actually can stand up for what is right because it is right. You don't have to be a Catholic even to realize that. George Washington said so. Our founding fathers said so years, hundreds of years ago. Uh, well over 200 years ago, they were writing that you can't have a, a society, unless there's a moral goodness, unless there's a moral fiber, that what they were writing, what they were designing in the Constitution could not possibly stand with an immoral population. Why? Well, because in order to have liberty, you have to have responsibility. And if you have an immoral population, they, they don't know responsibility. They won't accept responsibility. And uh, the entire society crumbles with that. Uh, they understood this very well. They had enough of the ancient Catholic training that came down to them through the centuries to still be able to understand that. Then you have nothing left but uh, where you have a society of basically criminals, then you need a society of prisons to control them because they can't control themselves or won't. And so there has to be a moral fiber in the populace of a nation to give it any foundation for liberty whatsoever. And I'm afraid this is why our nation is losing its, it, losing its liberty, why our people are losing their liberty now, because the moral foundation is being uh, corrupted, uh, not only from Washington, uh, not only from their state houses, but from the Vatican itself, from the modernists, from Francis and the rest. Look at the example that he sets. Mass corruption is exactly what the Freemasons were demanding back in the early 1800s. Uh, corruption en masse, they said. We have to corrupt the entire society to produce the world that we want. Uh, and for them, for them, that meant the eradication of Catholicism, absolute <clears throat> obliteration of, of Christianity and even the memory of Christ. Well, here we are. We're getting there. Uh, they've done their work, their diabolical work, very well. So we have to um, oppose it at the very root of it, and that is in the human soul, in the matter of faith. Once we, once we stand up and proclaim the kingship of Christ, as we should do and must do boldly, as the first Christians did, very clearly, then, um, <clears throat> and hopefully we'll rally the people who, who still have that, that faith, and um, you know, provide that leadership for them, and, and our voices are echoed by theirs then, then we need to find a way to build a Christian society. Is it possible? Oh, yeah. We look back in history and we see that there were Christian nations. There were truly Catholic nations. Uh, we look at Ecuador under Garcia Moreno. Um, he was assassinated because of this.